Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Galaxy Trucker, designed by Vlad Havatel and published by Czech Games Edition. This video is the second in a series which will take you step by step through learning the game. In part one, I showed you how to build your own ship, and now it's time to take that ship on an adventure through space. Remove all the components from the warehouse and replace them with the flight board. Give each player the two spaceship markers of their colour. The player who took the number one tile during building places one of their ships on the indicated starting space on the flight track. The player who took the number two tile places their ship two spaces behind and so on. The distance between the ships is depicted here. The ship at the front is referred to as the leader. The circle of triangles indicates the relative positions of the spaceships, each space representing one day of flight. The order of the ships can change during the flight, so now you can remove the number tiles that you took during building. Then, for each of your cabins, take two of the grey figures which represent human spacemen, and place them on the cabins. Also, on each battery component, place either two or three green tokens depending on how many E-cells are depicted. Take the cosmic credits and place them nearby to form the bank. I recommend that you look at the bank from time to time during the game to anticipate how much money you're going to make. And finally, for your first flight, you'll be using cards from the one deck. Look through them and take out the eight which have a star in the bottom left. These eight cards will form your first adventure. Now, normally you would shuffle these cards to make your own adventure deck, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to suggest that you let me do that for you. I've got the eight adventure cards here, I've shuffled them, and I'm going to go through them one at a time. For each card, I'm going to explain exactly what happens, and then you can pause the video and go through that card yourself. Alternatively, you could watch this whole video, and then just play through the cards yourself in your own random order. The leader reveals the first adventure card, so let's see what we get. An abandoned ship. So let me explain how this works, and then you can pause the video until you're ready for the next card. Apparently there's some kind of galactic protocol for reporting abandoned ships, but you know your comm system's always malfunctioning, so don't worry about it. But also, there's probably some of your own crew members who are sick to death of you being the captain. So now you've found an abandoned ship, you can fix it up and sell it to them. Only one player can use this card, and the leader gets to decide first. To take control of the ship, you need to spend the indicated number of crew members here, and then get the amount of credits shown here. So let's take a look at the game I have. The blue player is in the lead, and he only has four crew. He decides it might be unwise to continue the rest of the flight with only the captain, so blue passes on the opportunity. Red's up next, and Red decides that she's going to use the opportunity, because she's got lots of crew. She sells the abandoned ship to some of her own crew, discarding three of them, and takes four credits from the bank. Credits are kept secret from other players. Now, notice the number one in the bottom right of the card. This is the number of flight days lost in fixing up the abandoned ship, so Red needs to move her ship on the flight track backwards one space. And that's how abandoned ships work. So, let's move on to the next card. And the next card is... Planets. This card represents a star system with some inhabited planets, where you can land and barter with the locals for valuable goods. In flight order, starting with the leader, each player decides whether they're going to land or not, and if they do land, which planet they're going to land on. Only one player can land on each planet. The value of each piece of cargo at the end of the flight is worth the amount of credits shown here on the flight board. So Blue, who is still in the lead, chooses to land. He takes his other ship marker from his spaceship board and places it on the planet of his choice. He decides to land at the middle planet and collects one red and two blue cargo, which he puts in his ship. Red is next and she lands at the first planet, since she has space for the two red cargo. She picks up the goods and places them in her ship, remembering that red cargo can only go on special cargo hulls. The yellow player decides not to land, even though there are still planets available. After all players have collected their goods, those who did land lose a number of flight days as shown on the card, starting with the player currently at the back. 
So yellow didn't land and stays where he is. Then red moves back two spaces, only counting empty spaces. So she skips over the space with the yellow ship. And then blue also moves back two spaces. One thing that can happen is that the planet has more goods than you've got space for in your ship. In this case, you just pick up as many as you want and leave the rest behind. So that's how planets work. Let's move on to the next card. Well, it's all been very peaceful so far, hasn't it? But I think that's about to change. And yes, you've just flown into a meteoric swarm. Time to blame the navcomp again. This card depicts several small and or large meteors and the direction that they're coming from. They affect all players simultaneously. In order from top to bottom, the leader rolls two dice to determine the column or row that the meteor is impacting. So let's look at the first one. This is a large meteor coming in from the front. So let's see exactly where it hits. Column eight. Now, large meteors are so big that any shields that you've got on your ship won't protect you. The only way to deal with large meteors is to shoot them down with your cannons. If we look first at the blue player, he has a cannon in column eight, but it's facing the wrong way. So unfortunately, it's no good against this meteor and his ship is hit. This simply causes the component that was hit to be removed and it's placed in the space in the top right of the spaceship board. Note that this can cause other components to become disconnected. If this happens, they fall off too. Moving to the red ship, she has a cannon in column eight and so shoots the meteor and she's all okay. Yellow has a cannon in column eight, but it's a double cannon and double components do nothing at all unless they are powered with a battery. So yellow has a choice. Let the meteor hit and lose the double cannon or spend one battery token to power the cannon and blast the meteor. Yellow has lots of batteries, so he decides to power the cannon. Next, we have a small meteor coming in from the left. So we roll the dice to see where it's gonna hit. And the roll is a seven. Now, small meteors are a lot less dangerous. First of all, if they impact on a smooth side of a component, then they just bounce off. And on the blue ship, row seven from the left is a smooth side, so nothing happens. Red, however, has an exposed connector on row seven, so the ship is in danger. Now, she could protect her ship if she had a shield, but the only shield she has covers the ship from the front and the right only. So unfortunately, the small meteor impacts on the ship and the component falls off. Luckily, the crew members that were in there have already left the ship. Looking at the yellow ship, row seven from the left is also a smooth side. And remember, meteors bounce off unless they hit an exposed connector. Finally, looking back at the card, we have another small meteor coming in from the right and the roll is a five. On the blue ship, row five from the right hits a smooth edge, so the meteor bounces off. On the red ship, there's nothing in row five, so the meteor just passes by safely. But on the yellow ship, row five from the right is an exposed connector. However, due to supreme skill at building, he has a shield protecting the right side of his ship and spends one battery token to power the shield and the meteor bounces off. To summarize the meteor rules, look for this on the flight board. Small meteors bounce off smooth sides or can be protected against with shields. Large meteors cannot be protected against by shields and can only be shot at by cannons. So we've survived a meteor swarm. I wonder what's next. Card four is open space. Now this is a chance for all players to rev their engines to the max and leave their opponents far behind them. Starting with the leader, each player announces the strength of their engines and then moves that many spaces forward on the flight track. So blue is first and has an engine strength of two from the two single engines. So blue moves two spaces forward. Then it's yellow who has two single engines and a double engine. His engine strength is two, but he could spend one battery token to have an engine strength of four, which he decides to do. So he moves four spaces forward on the flight track and now he's in the lead. Red could also use a battery to give her a speed of three instead of one, but she decides not to use it. She's already quite far behind and only has two batteries and might need them later. So Red only moves one space. That was all pretty easy, wasn't it? So on with the next card. Aha, an abandoned station. 
This is similar to the abandoned ship in that only one player can use this opportunity, and the leader decides first. The difference is that you only need to have the crew shown on the card, you don't actually lose them. To help you remember the difference between having to lose crew and not, compare the abandoned station to the abandoned ship from earlier. The minus sign on the ship reminds you that you need to lose that amount of crew. The bonus you get from exploring the station is that you find some goods that the previous occupants left behind. Since Yellow is now first, he gets to decide if he'll explore the station. He has enough crew, but decides not to stop as he likes being in first position. Blue is next, but he only has four crew, so he cannot choose to stop. Red is the last to choose, and since she has plenty of crew, and the space for the cargo, she stops and picks it up, losing one flight day. And that's how abandoned stations work. Let's see what's next. This is a special event, and you follow the instructions on the card. This one is Stardust, and makes everyone lose a number of flight days equal to the number of exposed connectors on their ship. This is done in reverse player order, so let's take a look at Red first. The Red ship has seven exposed connectors, so the Red marker is moved back seven spaces. Blue's next, and Blue has a total of nine exposed connectors, ouch! The blue ship is moved back nine spaces. And finally, yellow only has four exposed connectors, so it moves back four spaces. Later flights will have all sorts of other interesting and exciting special event cards, but don't get too excited, because they're all normally really bad for you. Anyway, let's move on to card number seven. And here it is, an enemy ship bristling with weapons. I did warn you there would be some of these, didn't I? Anyway, each enemy is potentially a threat to all players, but they attack the players in order from front to back. The strength of the enemy is shown here. What happens to you if they defeat you is here, and the bonus you get for defeating them is at the bottom. Yellow's in front, so let's see what he can do and explain more about how cannons work. I mentioned during the first video that cannons are most effective when pointing forwards. So, this cannon here gives him a strength of 1. This double cannon, when powered, gives an additional strength of 2. These two cannons, however, are pointing sideways, and any cannons pointing sideways or behind only count at half strength. So Yellow's total strength is 2 without the double cannon, and 4 if he chooses to power the double cannon by spending a battery. There are three possible outcomes when fighting an enemy ship. First of all, if your strength is greater than theirs, then you defeat them, and you get the bonus for defeating them, and then that's it, the enemy is defeated, and it doesn't move on to the other players. Another option is that the enemy's strength is greater than yours. In that case, they defeat you, you suffer some kind of penalty, and then the enemy moves on to the next ship, and it keeps going until it's defeated, or until it's hit all players. The third option is that if you tie on strength with the enemy. In this case, you've fought them off, you haven't defeated them, but you don't suffer the bad penalties of the card. And then they move on to the next ship. So, Yellow chooses to power his double cannon, giving him a cannon strength of 4, which ties with the enemy ship. The smugglers now move on to the second player, which is Blue. Blue has a cannon strength of 3.5, which is not enough. So the smugglers steal two of his cargo, and they always steal the most valuable cargo first. If you have to lose cargo to the smugglers and you don't have enough, then you lose battery tokens to make up the difference. If you don't have enough battery tokens, then no worries. They arrive on your ship, don't find anything of value, and leave. Finally, the smugglers arrive at the red ship, who has a cannon strength of 2.5 normally, but this increases to 4.5 if she spends a battery, which she does. So she defeats the smugglers, hooray! Her bonus is the goods shown at the bottom of the card but she must spend one flight day picking up the cargo, which she decides to do. Now, she doesn't have enough room on her ship to store all of the goods, so she just picks up the most valuable. It's actually possible at this stage to rearrange your cargo, and you can dump some less valuable cargo into space to make room for better goods. Dumping cargo into space is actually against the galactic anti-littering laws, so under no circumstances must you ever tell anybody that I said it was okay to do this. So, that's it for the smugglers, let's hope it's plain sailing now until you reach your destination. 
On to the last card. Uh oh, I spoke too soon. You've just flown into the middle of a combat zone. Each line on this card is evaluated in order from top to bottom. Each part has a penalty for the player who is weakest in the area indicated. If multiple players are tied for who's the weakest, it's the one who is farthest ahead on the flight track that pays the penalty. So first up is crew, and the one with the fewest crew is going to lose three flight days. Blue has the fewest crew, only having four, so blue moves back three spaces. Next, the player with the least engine strength loses two crew. In flight order from the leader backwards, each player declares their speed. Yellow has plenty of batteries left, so spends one of them and declares a speed of four. Note that the ship markers are not actually moved on the flight track. Red is next, and she could also spend her battery to get a speed of three, which would be more than blue. However, she's only got one battery remaining and chooses to save it for the last line of the card. So she declares a speed of one. Blue has a speed of two, so it's the red player who suffers the penalty and loses two crew members. The last test is based on cannon strength, with the losing player getting shot at. Again, from front to back, yellow declares first and chooses to spend a battery to get a cannon strength of four. Blue declares a cannon strength of three and a half, and red spends her last battery to get a cannon strength of four and a half. So blue, unfortunately, suffers the penalty. The card shows whether the weapon fire is light or heavy, and the direction that it comes from. In this case, the blue ship is going to face light cannon fire from behind, followed by heavy cannon fire from behind. The dice are rolled for the first attack to see which column is hit, and it's a seven. Now, shields can be used to protect against light cannon fire. Unfortunately, blue shields do not cover the rear of the ship, so the engine is destroyed. And since the engine was the only thing keeping these other two components attached, they fall off too. And now onto the heavy weapons fire, for which there is no protection. Oh, this could be bad. Phew, it's a 10. It misses. A reminder of enemy cannon fire is printed on the flight board. Well, that's the end of the adventure. I hope you made it through safely. Let's see what's waiting for you at Journey's End. Now that you've all safely arrived at your destination, or maybe not, it's time to add up the credits and see who's winning. The information on the flight board is dealt with from left to right. First of all, these numbers show you how many credits you get based on the order in which you arrive at your destination. So in our game, yellow would get four credits, blue would get three, and red gets two. The number here shows the bonus for who has the prettiest ship which is the one with the least number of exposed connectors. In our example, yellow has the least number of exposed connectors, with only four, so he gets the two credit bonus. Next is your cargo, and you get the credits shown here for each of the goods on your ship. So in our game, yellow gets no credits, as he has no goods, blue gets one measly credit for the one blue cargo, but red gets a whopping ten credits for two yellow and two green cargo. And finally, for each component you lost along the way, you must pay a penalty of one credit. This is why any lost components were placed in the top right of your player board. So yellow loses nothing, as his ship was undamaged, blue loses four credits, because he lost four components, and red loses one credit. Note that there's a maximum loss of five credits from losing components, as indicated on your ship. And that's the end of the first flight, so let's count up the credits and see who's got the most. In our game, the blue player has absolutely no credits whatsoever. The yellow player has 6 credits, but red is currently winning the game with 15 credits. But the adventure doesn't stop here. In the full game, you'll fly two additional flights with bigger ships and more dangerous cards. There's also some extra rules such as alien crew members and battling space pirates. I'll explain all of these extra rules and more in the third video in the series, coming soon. Until then, take care, and thanks for watching.